the gratitude. Feel it. Because in the gratitude, if you feel it, it will increase the faith that you feel. Okay. Good morning. Nice and chirpy. You don't realize that we're going to talk about the 37 factors of enlightenment, right? It's a practitional um, type of discussion. And you will find it most, um, probably most useful if you are already on the journey. Okay? But for those of you who just come and enjoy a Dhamma talk, well, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. Okay? Um, how many of you, just, just for my impression, how many of you actually uh, regularly meditate? Meaning more than once a week. Lah. <laughs> daily, daily. Huh? Okay, great, great. What about attending retreat? How many of you have gone for retreats? Uh, one day retreat, also can. Lah. <laughs> Never mind, lah. anything goes. Huh? Any more? How, the longest time period for a retreat? Seven days? Ten days. Oh, ten days. Well done. One month? You don't have? Oh, okay, never mind. Next time we'll do a one month one. Huh? <laughs> okay. What do you understand by the, this term, the instant factors of enlightenment? What do you understand of the term? Are you familiar with it? Yes? Conceptually? There are just 37, a lot of them, isn't it? And if you've attended a talk which I gave much earlier, I mentioned that actually you can pie it down to just how many? Five. Excellent. Full marks. <laughs> now, are you able to offer me the five uh, mental factors? Sat, sat. Sat, the. Well done. And? Viria, very good. Sati, yeah. Samadhi, and? Panya, excellent. Nibbana. <laughs> okay. In that talk, if you recall, I mentioned that actually you don't have to worry very much about memorizing 37 because 37 is a lot to memorize. And that fundamentally, we are looking at five. Five mental factors that you must possess you must have it in order that you are able to see the Dhamma as a first step, these five mental factors. Then suddenly today I say, 37, it's a Dhamma journey. So what's going on? Let me explain. The reason why the last time I call it a roadmap and this time round I call it a journey is this. It's a road map. A map is something that tells you how to get from point A to B. How to get from a mental state of a whirling, a circular man. You know, we are just normal, secular people. How do you get to this, from this point to a state of mind when you see the Dhamma, when you realize the Dhamma? And in the Theravadian lingo, when you enter the stream. How do you get from this point to that point? And the Buddha has provided a map on how to do it systematically. And in, on this map, there is a practice that we must all undertake. We have to go through that practice. And as you go through, as you go through this practice, that is 
a journey, a journey of the mind. Your understanding increases, your feel for the practice improves, and at some point you go from, I don't know what's going on, to, oh, I see. I got it, the oh, I see. I got it. I think I'm getting it. And then at some point you say, I think I have understood. So there is a development of the mind. Slowly, for some people, very slowly. For others, it comes in jerks, you know, sur surges. You go from, I know something, to, eh, I know more, and suddenly, I know a lot. It goes in surges. For some people, you, you feel that you haven't gone anywhere. What they call engine tak you know. Start already, the car doesn't move. And it happens. But whatever it is, it's the individual's journey. And these 37 factors of enlightenment actually maps out that journey. It tells you how mental states, the critical mental states, are transforming in your mind. Okay? Now, I'm going to take you through suttas. My view is Buddha says the things, or said the thing most beautifully. And we take it from there. Take it from the way he said it. Okay? So the Buddha, this is from Diga Nikaya 16, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. It's a very long sutta, beautiful sutta, but very long, and it traces the last days of the Buddha's life. And in this sutta, there was one occasion when the Buddha sat down to give a Dhamma talk, and he told the monks this. Monks, for this reason, those matters which I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learnt by you. Practiced, developed, cultivated, so that this holy life may endure for a long time, that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. Note the way the Buddha said it. Learned, so you must know what they are. Conceptually, know what they are. Practice. When you have the information, as far as you're concerned, they are only knowledge that recedes, that recites in the mind. If you haven't done anything to develop these conditions, they are, as far as you're concerned, they are only knowledge that you hold in trust. It's like having a bank account that you can't use. You lost the key, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't got the code, you, you don't have the PIN number, you can't use the bank account. So when you learnt it, you have the knowledge, the information. When you practice, that is when this information becomes a reality for you. It comes alive for you. When you start to practice. When you develop, you are now watering the plant and you're waiting for fruits. Cultivated, developed and cultivated. Cultivated, the idea here is you've got to put in effort, you have to spend time, and it takes a while for fruits to form. It is a process. It is not one-off. Learning can be one-off. You pick up the information, you pick it up. For some of us, it's not one-off because it takes a while for us to get it. But practice, developing for sure, developing and cultivating, it requires effort, the correct conditions, it requires you to tweak as you go along. You understand, huh? So look at the way the Buddha said it. He didn't say you must know. He said you must practice and develop and cultivate. For what? As long as 
there are no one who understand the path and the fruits, the path and the realization, the holy life, the teaching will disappear. That's the reason why he said this, so that this holy life may endure for a long time. This, is, this holy life is not just about being a monk. You must remember that. It is not just about being a monk. It's about a way of life according to the Dhamma. If you live your life as he taught, as he had taught, then you are, in your own way, living a holy life. You get it? So, do not say that I'm not in Rome, therefore I'm not living a holy life. I can do whatever I want. If you are a student of the Buddha, if you are a disciple of the Buddha, then as part of your aspiration, you want to live by the method, by the advice that he had left behind. And when you do that sincerely, you are living a holy life. Okay? So that it may endure for a long time. Why? Because, as I said, if no one understands the method, no one is doing it right. After a while, people would have forgotten what it means. You understand that? Why is it that it may be for the benefit and the happiness of others? Because if you live the holy life properly and you know what you are doing, then what you are doing will help others. When you begin to understand the Dhamma, when the Dhamma comes alive for you, it is not just you benefiting. Whoever that come into contact with you and has been able to understand what you are sharing, that person will also experience the joy of the Dhamma. So in your heart, when you are practicing, it is not, I'm going to save the world. It is nothing to do with you magnanimously saving others. It is not that. It is you doing your part to be helpful. That's all. And you feel for others. You feel empathy for others. And therefore, you want to also help another alleviate that sense of dukkha. Dukkha, in our practice, we know dukkha is everywhere. Everywhere, every minute of the day. And if you really understand the Dhamma, you will experience a relief from the dukkha. And you can then help another understand how to taste that relief. In whatever little way you understand, truly understand, huh? we're not talking about past exam. But try out, truly understand. In whatever little way that you understand and you are able to feel happier, you will be able to help another. That's just the way it is. Okay, give you an example. Suppose, let's say, you get into a room, no need this big, about a third of the size, get into a room, and everybody's really grumpy there. They're feeling sad, they're grumpy, not happy. But you come in and you are beaming from year to year. This big, your mouth. You beamed at the world. Don't know why, but you're just beaming. And guess what? Everybody starts to beam, starts to smile, start to feel better. What are you doing? Being a positive, infectious ground zero. Positive. Not Zika. Okay? And that's what you are going to do. Okay. And then the Buddha said, what are these matters? They are. Now, you must memorize this. Eh? At some point, it will come easy for you. But for a start, memorize this. Four foundations of mindfulness. I won't repeat the Pali. 
You can read it. Four Foundations of Mindfulness, Four Right Efforts, Four Roads to Power, or Psychic Powers, they call it, Five Spiritual Faculties, Five Mental Powers, Seven Factors of Enlightenment, Eight Noble Eightfold Path. All in all, 37. When I flip this, from this page, I expect you to memorize, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not difficult, huh? Four, 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 five, five, seven, eight. It's like a telephone number. Four, 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 five, five, seven, eight, okay? Ah. You break it down into that kind of numbers, it's much easier because after all, eight, four, five, you know, the one before that is seven, factors of enlightenment, and then five, five, they are the same, you know, spiritual factors. They're just the, the three fours that you've got to remember, okay? Starting with four, foundation of mindfulness. Okay? Ah, this is a nice slide. Okay? I can flip. I'll explain them now. You know, put them side by side as the different stages of practice. If you go into the suttas, actually you will find in various suttas, in different suttas, eh? in different suttas, the Buddha would say, if you practice the four foundations of mindfulness, you will realize. At some point you will realize. Or he will say, if you have, not the four right efforts, he will say, uh, if you have the five faculties, or the five powers, all the seven factors of enlightenment. He usually doesn't talk about all 37. He will say, if you have this, or you have four, you have five, you have five, you have seven, you have eight, you will realize. He doesn't talk, he doesn't always talk about all 37. He usually just talk, you have that set, you have that set, and I've said this before, you must have the full set. You cannot just pick one of five. Five mental factors, I pick sadha. This life. Next life, I do virya. Eh, not bad. Wait for another two more, then I got to do meditation. Doesn't work like that. It has to come in a package, right? How is it today I'm talking about all 37 and insisting that they are all equally important now? The reason is this. When you start off, when you start out in this practice, you actually have no idea what you're doing. For most of us, we hear about the Four Noble Truths, we hear about the Eightfold Paths, we hear about very the Kilat, you know, we know Tilakkana, we have no idea what we're doing. So, if you like, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, you can consider it as a very preliminary start point. When you start off, one of the things that you need to start to build, a, a, a skill that you must start to develop, as a start point, a skill that you must start to develop is mindfulness, sati. And what is this mindfulness we are talking about? Sati is a state of mind which is very clear and very aware of what's happening now, right now. Clear, awareness, and focus and able to remember. If you say, I only know now, but you don't register the features, that's not sati. Sati actually means an ability, it combines. There is an ability to remember. When you start out, you have no idea. You don't even know what sati. You don't even know how to develop. So at that start point, the Buddha said, I'm going to give you four objects. In these four objects, you take your attention and focus on it. It's actually quite chim ready. Huh? You take your attention and you focus on one of these four objects. So the first one that he asked, he used as a focal point for attention, the first one is the body, starting with breathing putting your attention on a breathing process. Earlier on, when we did the meditation, the short coming of the mind, I wouldn't call it meditation, it's a short coming of the mind, 
I ask you to put your attention on breathing, not on breath. That was how the Buddha did it. Breathing is a process. Breath is a point, not a breath. Breathing, a process. So right at the beginning, you put your attention on an object which is gross, easy for you to see. Breathing is obvious. Sitting, posture, sitting, standing, walking, activities. These are all activities which should be obvious. So because you are new and you don't really know, you are then developing a very basic skill to constantly bring that awareness, first know there is an awareness, then bring it to an object and stay there for a while. Do you have to make it so minute? No. Initially, you try. Just be focused. After a while, there is a general awareness. That one we'll go into details on another class that deals with mindfulness meditation. Today, I'm just going through the concepts, okay? So you start off being aware of the body, its activities, its gestures. It's very gross. At some point, you become, you be, as you become more aware of the body, now you can put this attention on something which is more subtle, feelings. And you are not asked to have multiple Descriptions for feelings, you only have three. Painful, pleasant, neither painful nor pleasant. Three types, three main categories. Then it goes even more subtle. And now you are looking as a mental object, the mind. The, the state of the mind. And then finally, you're looking at features, detailed features of the mind, mental factors, very detailed, very minute. But, but these are in association with Dhamma. Buddha talk about these Dhamma. You are beginning, by now you are, so, you are way more skillful, you are able to spot more details about the mind. That is a practice. As a start point, when you don't know any better, the very first thing you need to start to develop is the skill of mindfulness. Preliminary step. And in correlation with it, the same time, not after I've done mindfulness, I will do right effort. In correlation with it, in order that you can and you are able to do mindfulness practice properly, you should also learn to not have negativities in your mind. Our mind, our mind has a propensity to drift towards negative energies. Non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not a reason. Abandoning of evil, unskillful qualities that have a reason. If you have this in the broad category, it would be loba, dosa, moha, you can't really tell. But loba and dosa. What's loba? Greed. Wanting. Wanting. Now, if you look at your own mind, right? Just look at it once in a while, ah. Huh? When you look at your own mind, at any one time, at any one time, even now, what do you feel? What do you see? There's a slight... There's a slight dif uh, uh, dissatisfaction, isn't it? There's a slight... Because the room is a bit warm, and then you... Uh, the, the floor is a bit hard, and you... Uh, yeah? Yes? Be honest in front of Buddha. Yeah? How many of you right now, right at this moment, all you feel is meta? Don't have, uh, not even meta, seriously. The chances are, if I ask you, look into your mind now, you're going to look and go, I'm just bored. I'm doing nothing. I don't know what's going on. Ew. 
if you look into your mind at any one point, right, the chances are it is not feeling very peaceful, very content, is it? You're not replying because you have never seen your mind. <laughs> or you're not replying because uh, you don't want the rest of the world to think I'm not very nice. Or you're just waiting for the person next to you to reply. La. <laughs> if you think about it, huh, just look in at any one point. What is that state? And the odds are, it is not meta. The odds are, I bet my money on the table with you. <laughs> the odds are. The odds are, at any one time when you look into the mind, you are not seeing compassion. Nothing to be compassionate about. Eh? The odds are. Huh? Or you're feeling very sati or sadder. You see, sadder is faith. Sati, mindfulness. Somebody you don't have uh, at that time. Panya, no, nothing. None of the above will be present in your mind at any one time. So therefore, at any one time, you're not going to see the Dhamma. You see that? So this four right efforts, in effect, is to get you to catch your mind at any one time. And when you are aware, at that moment when you're aware, you look in and you go, uh-oh, not pleasant. You've got to get it out. Meaning, drop it. Don't harp on it. Let it go if it is unpleasant. Even if it's simple thing like I'm restless, drop it. Restlessness is just an energy, a mental energy. Drop it. Say things like, I'll be fine. I'm good. And then you feel good. You see, your mind, your mind is so gullible. It just listens to you. <laughs> but if you say, I'm bored, I'm really bored, oh, I'm so bored, guess what? Your mind agrees with you. Then die, la. you're not going to meditate already because you're so bored. You see what I'm saying? So this four right effort is about catching yourself at any one time and doing the right thing when you caught it. Doing the right thing is, if it's a negativity in the mind, restlessness, feeling particularly lousy, you want something, you are annoyed, you are tired and lazy, and you feel like you weigh a ton, when you have all these negativities, you catch it, you drop it. You don't catch it and go, oh, look at that. Ooh, I want to see how long it lasts. You die. It will last for as long as you love it. Because you just embraced it. You get it? The moment you catch it, you purge it. It's not there, don't let it be there. If it is there, get rid of it. As I have said, and you know it for your own self, at any one time, you're not going to catch something positive there. You may just catch neutral. And the odds are, when you catch neutral, you are bored. Now, when you see, you, I'm aware, and you become aware of joy, Joy, not a name, joy is good. It's a positive energy. And what do you do? You keep it. You maintain it. You increase it. If it is not there, no joy, no metta, no compassion, no, no kindness, no nothing, bring it up. That's what he said. The arising of skillful qualities that have not yet a reason. So, between these two, done together, they are done together. Mindfulness of the mind, you will know at that one point what's in your mind. And this is to be done not only in 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes meditation, it's to be done daily life for a practitioner. For those of you who go for a retreat, not enough. This has to be done whenever you can on the daily, in, your, in your daily life. And this 
is the, the start point for someone new to this journey and you have not done much about this journey and you want to see the Dhamma. The fact that you are here means you are curious about the Dhamma. Some of you more desperate than others. The fact that you're here and then you must know these are steps there are steps to develop the mental states necessary to see the Dhamma and this is how it's done. Starting with developing the skill of mindfulness, mindful watching, allowing the mind to be focused at any one time on a object, whether it's the body, the feeling, the mind, mental states, Dhamma. The mind become aware. And then when you see that there are no, there are negativities, you must make the effort to let them go. I was just telling some, some friends yesterday, we love to own negativities. Somehow we don't seem to own positivities. What do I mean? When you're angry, when there is anger, the odds are you say, I'm angry, I'm furious. You have owned it. I am embedded in the anger. Anger is you. If you have greed, oh, I'm not nice. Uh, I really want this. I so sometimes you will say, I'm not nice. That's when you're practicing. Sometimes you say, I deserve it. You're feeling entitled. That's when you're not practicing. But it's I. But then when you have metta, when you're feeling metta, when you're feeling compassion, you don't really say, I am feeling metta. You say, there's metta, there's metta. I'm feeling, there is love, you know, there's feeling joy. There is a feeling of joy. Because when you say, I am joyous, joy disappear. When the I enter the picture, I am having metta, metta disappear. Have you, have, you, have you wondered about that? Or have you never experienced metta? <laughs> then that one very sad. <laughs> that one must come for private session. More, all of you, actually all of you, I see these beaming faces. All of you would have experienced metta. Because you have experienced metta, you will. You will feel the joy. Metta is joy. Ah? Metta is joy. If you feel metta and no joy, I don't know what you're feeling. Okay? Okay. Now, this is step one. At the beginning stage, this is what you have to do. If you are doing it right, and you're doing it well, they become mental energies that you can harness. If you do it wrong, then they are no more than an occasional visitor. Chinese New Year visit only. Rest of the year, no sound, no picture. You understand that? Hello? You understand that, huh? If you are consistent, consistently practicing mindfulness, if you are consistently practicing mindfulness and you do it well, eventually mindfulness becomes a roommate, which is right at the end. It becomes a bojangas. But if you are part-time practitioner, part-time as in once a year, Acham Bram come to town, chong. Then I am now very good, I'm much better already. I go visit Acham Bram. Uh, that type, uh, that type of part time practitioner, then mindfulness is long time no see friend. Chinese New Year visit only. You understand? Okay. If you are a serious practitioner, and you're very keen about understanding the Dhamma, and you sit and you meditate, eventually certain mental energies, which are the same, will start to become stronger in your mind. Chanda. Chanda is not just, I want. I want. This Chanda is deep in you, a very strong desire to see the Dhamma. Is a very strong desire for practice. This chanda sits on faith. 
if this chanda doesn't sit on faith, the faith, that chanda is no more than a pipe dream. It's something that you tell your, yourself, you tell your kids. We go Disneyland, ah? maybe next week. Brave one. Ah. You understand? It's just something you say. Nice to have, good to have. This chanda is not nice to have. It's, I want it. I must have it. I am determined to see it. And this is what you will experience when your faith is very strong. You understand that Dhamma is something really, truly, spectacularly beautiful. You want to see it. Then it becomes a mental energy that you can harness. As long as it's not a mental energy, it's just squatter. It's not even squatter. It's a long time no see friend. This one, it's a desire that actually supports your meditation. You want it. You sit and you say, I will stay. I will practice. When the Bodhisattva, when Buddha, before he became the Buddha, he was a practitioner, he had chanda, this particular type. Even if my blood dry up in this body, I will sit and meditate. We all, when my leg cramp, I will stand and walk. <laughs> Not same. Uh, people wait until blood dry up. Leh. You see the difference? Okay. Energy. This very year is the desire, it's the effort, not desire, it's the effort to do right by the mind. It is this very year is the same as earlier, the four, the four right efforts. Okay? This very year is the four right effort. By now, you are adamant about keeping your mind space clean, pure. Anything negative drop, don't let it come up. Your emphasis, your effort will be actually don't let it come out. Because not much negativities will come up by now. And there will be this good feeling, warm feeling, kind feeling, meta and so on. Very strong. It should start. The word chitta, which is the mind, has never actually been explained properly in the sutta. So it's going to be my understanding of the word chitta. It's becoming aware of the mind. And knowing the state of mind, using that as a meditation object. Mind, because it's never properly explained in the sutta. Okay? Vimangsa is investigation, i.e. looking at phenomenal, understanding it according to the Dhamma. As you understand, it becomes a mental force. It's a force, an energy in the mind that keeps you going on the meditation. These four will help with samatha. The, sorry, samadhi meditation, concentration meditation. You have it, you can hold. Indriyas. As a mental energy at this level, I put them together. You can see them side by side. Huh? And I've said before, there are key, five key ones, right? These are the five key ones said here. And Buddha had said, if you have these five mental faculties, you can realize. Right here, as part of the journey, basically what it means is, in your daily life, if you are serious about wanting to see the Dhamma, in your daily life, these five mental energies should surface. In your daily life. Every time you think of the Buddha, there is gratitude, there is joy, there is the sense that I'm inspired, I want to practice. Every time you think of the Buddha, it should not be a case where every time you think of the Buddha, all you want is Siyosaki Hyo. <laughs> Three joysticks. Done my morning greeting. Then evening, another three more. 
done my evening greeting. It should not be like this. It should be every time you think of the Buddha, you will say, hey, time to practice, huh? time to let go of the annoyance, time to not be so agitated, moderation in eating, that kind of thing. It should be like this. Again, Viriya, again, can you see that? Because if you have sadda, if you truly have sadda, what does it mean? It means you are mindful of the Dhamma. It means you are mindful of teachings, right? And if you are mindful of teaching, next minute you lash out. It's when you don't, when you are not mindful that you will give in to your instincts. But when you are mindful of those Dhamma, Buddha and Dhamma, you will not lash out. You will control, hold. Sati is awareness, you know. Samadhi is concentration. And Panya, Panya is when the mind knows what it is doing. Okay? As you develop these mental energies, they become stronger. And when they become stronger, they are able, these mental energies will now be able to lead you to the next level of spiritual understanding. Same thing. Sattva, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, Panya. They are repeated. I will show you why. By this stage, which is almost the end, these are mental forces that arise in you spontaneously. As seven factors of enlightenment, the seven bujangas. First, they don't come out one at a time. They can. Initially, that's what happens. At the start point, when there is very strong awareness, very strong mindfulness, one of those that doesn't waver, it is constant. The mind is just alert, constant. Let me just describe the Bojangas. When the mind is alert, aware and constant in its awareness, at some point, you begin to be aware that this is anicca, this is impermanent, that this is condition. Everything is conditioned. You feel it, you see it, you understand it. When that happens, that is Dhamma Vichaya a state of mind that constantly look at the world and see the Dhamma. Everything that you do, you will see the Dhamma. You eat, you will see craving. That's Dhamma. To you, it, to a practitioner in this state of mind, it is seeing craving, not tasting the food and enjoying the taste. You do realize the energy of craving that arises when your tongue comes into contact with the food. And then in your mind you say, this is a rising of craving. And there the sensation of dukkha. That's how you will feel it. And then you will say, all the more I must practice. And there will be the sense, the search of desire to practice and keeping that mind space clean. And at some point, you begin to feel really inspired. You feel happy. When you feel happy, the mind settles and you experience tranquility. With tranquility, the concentration is strong. And there is the sense of detachment towards the phenomenal that arise and fall away. It's just, things are just happening. They are just like that. That's what you'll be saying in your mind. Things are just like that. You accept it. And you're actually happy observing things that arise and fade away. This is when the Eightfold Path feels right and beautiful for you. 
So this thing about samaditi, the right understanding, what is right understanding, understanding of the Four Noble Truth, right thought, um, you know the three right thoughts, right? Okay, do I have to explain this? Yes. <laughs> Samaditi, right understanding. Right understanding is understanding of the four noble truths. What is the four noble truths? Or what are the four noble truths? That there is dukkha. Dukkha has been translated as suffering. That the reason, there is a reason for dukkha to arise. That reason is craving. Craving for sensual gratification, sense organ gratification. So taste, sight, hearing, touch and so on. There is craving for being alive, becoming. And sometimes there is craving for no more being alive, to, to, to be gone, to finish. Those are cravings. And then the belief that it is possible for this craving to drop completely and therefore you can experience absolute unconditioned bliss. Unconditioned bliss. And the method he explained on how to achieve that state of bliss is the Eightfold Path. It can be developed. So first noble truth, that there is dukkha has to be understood. Craving has to be abandoned. You have to drop craving. Relief, cessation, has to be tasted, realized. The word is sachikiriya, to be realized. And the Eightfold Path has to be developed. If it's part of the 37 factors of enlightenment, you are already developing the Eightfold Path. Okay? And if indeed this is your understanding, then on a daily basis, thought, eh? sankapa, on a daily basis, you will learn to tell yourself, it's okay, I can let things be. Therefore, the first right thought is nekama, renunciation. Let it go. Renunciation. The second right thought is no anger, no ill will. If you can let go, you wouldn't let go. Not laughing means you blur already. <laughs> if you can let it be, you are unlikely to yell. You are unlikely to be angry. Right? So, no ill will. And if you have no ill will, you are unlikely to engage in activities that it's going to hurt people. No cruelty. If you can let things be, you won't get angry so easily and you are not going to be cruel. That's what it means. If you can't let things be, I'm not happy, you know, he said me, he would say. Or she said me. I'm not happy. I want my revenge. Can't let go, ma. Then you go and get your revenge, oh. You then let go, ah. You get it. This is how your mind, the mind works, that's all. So if you really want to walk this path, you really want to see the Dhamma, there's a lot of things to do. A lot of things to do. Not difficult. Once you begin to understand why, it's actually not that difficult, but it runs against our character, our habits, not sorry, not character, but it runs against our habit, our instincts, okay? And if you have the right thought, that must translate into right speech, right action, and how you earn a living, right livelihood. Summer Wayama is the same. It's virya, it's keeping the mental the space clean, pure, and now you have Samasati and Samasamadhi. Now, 
when you set out right at the beginning, I said you probably have no idea about sati. You don't really know how to practice. You just do it, try, develop the skill, and you're not very sure how it's done. When you first set out, by now, you know how to do it, and you do it well. As you develop the skill, at some point, it is no longer just a skill to have that mental state. At some point, the mental state becomes a part of your daily mind. The mind, a state of mind, for you, it is a regular state. For the rest of the world, it may be a, the, the mind is constantly distracted, which has been rightly and beautifully called the monkey mind, right? For the rest of the world, what they are experiencing is a monkey mind, a mind that pops, hops all over the place, unable to sit still, and you don't even know it's hopping all over the place because you're part of the hopping. The mind hops, you hop, 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 hop all over the place. When you have mindfulness, that is no longer just a skill, but a part of your way of life, a state of mind that is regularly you, that mind, that mindfulness stabilizes. The mind stabilizes. It's no longer hopping all over. As you practice, this becomes a regularity. Mindfulness. Okay? There is a sutta. Uh, let me explain some other things here. Where the Buddha talk about how the five mental states which I kept talking about actually work in collaboration with each other. They support each other to get you to a state of mind that you can see the Dhamma. So you look at this one. Eh? The Blessed One addressed Venerable Sariputta thus, Sariputta, thus the noble disciple who is completely dedicated to the Tathagata and has full confidence in him, entertain any perplexity or doubt about the Tathagata or the Tathagata's teaching. What does it mean? Will you wonder whether Buddha was right? whether the Dhamma works. One who has full confidence, this is minimally a sotapanna. When they use the word full confidence, confirm confidence, they are talking about a sotapanna. Having said that, what I would like to draw your attention to is the point here. If you have absolute faith, Forget about your designation. You just have a lot of faith. Will you ever doubt Buddha or Dhamma? That's just all he said. Buddha or Dhamma. And the reply. One who is completely dedicated to the Tathagata and has full confidence does not entertain any perplexity or doubt about the Tathagata or his teaching full confidence about who the Buddha was, whom, what the Buddha was, who he was, and what he taught. What do we mean? That he is realized, about confidence in the Buddha, that he is realized, that he knows what he is teaching, that he practiced it, and about the Dhamma, that it works, the method works. It will lead you to a state of mind where you no longer experience dukkha. No longer will you experience dukkha, suffering. Okay? Will you have any doubt? No. It is indeed to be expected, Venerable Sir, that a noble disciple who has faith will dwell with energy aroused for the abandoning of unwholesome states and the acquisition of wholesome states, that he will be strong, firm in exertion, 
not shirking the responsibility of cultivating wholesome states. That energy is his faculty of energy. So, if you have faith, confirm faith, you will try, you will try to dwell, to live, dwell is to live with virya. If you have faith, you will try and keep your mind pure. You believe in what he said, you will do it according to the way he taught. And he tells you, you have to keep the mental space clear, clean, pure. He will be strong, look, strong, firm in exertion, not shocking the responsibility. You ask yourself this. You know there are five precepts. We know that. Every time you stare at your parking coupon, do you remember the five precepts? <laughs> I love this one because invariably people will giggle. Because this guy very, don't know why, primordial, you know, very instinctive. And here he said, you'll be strong. You'll be firm in exertion and you do not shirk the responsibility. So you tell yourself, I have to try, I will not give in. There is a responsibility here. Okay? So if you have faith that his method works, you will try to do the right thing. Try very hard. And you will live with that energy, that virya. It is when you have no faith. Oh, put it aside. Uh, sorry, put it aside differently. It is not that you have no faith. Right? Everyone in this room has faith. But your faith is a little bit um, discounted. Your faith is one which is uh, periodic. Sometimes you remember, I'm a, I'm a student of the Buddha. Sometimes, huh? Who? Uh, don't quite have it. I'm a Buddhist only when I'm arguing with another person. Then in my daily life, when I'm peeling the parking coupon, huh? Who? Uh, I forgot. When that happens, the faith is not strong. The, te the teaching doesn't sit in your heart strongly. If the teaching sits in your heart strongly, you'll try. Okay? So here he said, you have the faith and it's strong, you will want to have, uh, you will want to dwell with the virya. To be expected, one with faith and whose energy is aroused will be mindful will be mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and discretion. I want you to pay attention to two things here. Possessing, you, you are in possession of mindfulness, very clear mindfulness. This is, this is you are clear and you know and you will choose to do the right thing. And, see this word, remembers and recollects. Remember what I said earlier on, sati is not just about being in the moment. Sati has the element of noting and remembering. This is what the Buddha said. One who remembers and recollects your processing machinery doesn't just stop at seeing. It continues to register the features. Why is this important? Because when you are wanting to see the Dhamma, when you want to see the Dhamma, the mind must be able to pick out all the relevant parts
cards about the seeing, what you're noting. Pick up the relevant part, compare it to the material you have gathered in your mind, your, your, your understanding of the, the Dhamma. It collects, it packs it there, and it waits for you to go and correlate. And if you cannot remember how to correlate, if you don't remember what's taught, what's taught, taught to you, if you don't remember what's taught, if you don't remember what's anicca, you see anicca so you don't know what's going on. Huh? See what? Uh? See, see what? Uh, my mind go blank at see what? Uh? That's a very common thing. It's either you didn't put in enough material for the mind to see something, or you put in, but you don't remember, then die. You, you, you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> or you, you politely see. Politely see what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so mindfulness has two critical components just to refresh the memory. Mindfulness practice. Mindfulness has two critical components. Number one, you are paying attention to something as it happens, making no judgment, very objectively noting. Objectively noting. So you see the features, the details. And number two, if you see the features and it is something notable, remember it. Remember how it arises, remember how it fades away. When you are at a retreat and you're talking to the teacher, the teacher will say, what do you remember? It is not about memory work only, it's about what you saw and collect so that you can report and share. Okay? If you not, don't collect, don't remember, then when you report, your, your statement will be very short. I saw something. Teacher say, what did you see? Uh, don't remember. How do I help you? How can I help? Okay? So, if you see something and you are serious about the meditation, my advice is get a notebook, cheap one, 25 cents, and note into the book the little parts that you remember seeing. And the odds are you will forget, okay? Faculty of Concentration, it is to be expected that a noble disciple who has faith, whose energy is aroused, whose mindfulness is established, will gain concentration, will gain one-pointedness of mind. Okay. One who has faith, his energy, his virya, will be aroused. If your virya is aroused, what happens is when you arouse the virya, your mental space, you keep it clean, you keep it pure. Only then would your mindfulness be strong. If you are always agitating about something, then you are caught up in your agitation, you are caught up about whatever thoughts. You can't be mindful, you get it. If your mindfulness is established, only then will your concentration be strong. And this is the kind of concentration that leads to jhana. You ask about jhana, how is it done? All these steps must be there. The ones who meditate regularly and say, I do one hour, you know, and I've been meditating for 10 years, uh, but I've never seen whatever they call jhana. And then if you start to probe a little bit more, you're likely to hear things like, oh, mindfulness, uh, never really do that. Eh? I thought just have to do meditation. Ma. No, mindfulness. Earlier on when we did the med we remember when we did that calming of the mind, and I said, put your attention on the breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. Actually, that is mindfulness. Putting your attention on the breathing, observing the breathing process, noting the, the form of it, the features of it. That's mindfulness. If you do that 
correctly and skillfully, the mind will steal. That's concentration. When the mind steals, that's concentration. Okay? And he said, well, again, concentration will gain one-pointedness of mind. Having made release the object, you actually, the mind goes still, you no longer hold on to whatever that helped the mind to go still. Ultimately, it is about a mind that goes still, not about the object. Okay? It is to be expected that a noble disciple who's, who has faith, whose energy is aroused, mindfulness is established, mind is concentrated, will understand. Panya arises when all the other mental factors are in place. And this is a really beautiful, this is seeing the Dhamma. This samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving. In other words, we, mental energies that occasionally become human forms, on animals with forms, we, the arising of beings, yourself arising and fading away, has been going on for the longest time. For so long, you no longer know when it all began. There's no beginning. It's just on and on and on. And we have been stuck. Stuck because you don't know and you continue to do the same thing. What don't we know? We don't know about the Four Noble Truths. Then you say, but I know what. You know conceptually, but you don't understand it intuitively. It doesn't sink in. The Four Noble Truths hasn't sunk into the mind in such a way that in everything that you do, in everything that you do, there is just this awareness. Don't cling, don't hold, no point, because... These things will just hold you on and drag you along. Dukkha. You don't, feel, you don't feel it the way it can help you to break out of this samsara. Fettered by craving, our instincts to gratify the sense basis, our instinct to spend time with the people we love and to get away from the ones we don't like, our instincts, this craving energy, it's the one that chain you to a becoming. Again and again, we come up. You die tomorrow, you will flip up. The energy will flip again, start again. Primary school, secondary school, PSLE, scarier. <laughs> but never mind, lah. continue. Okay. But the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, the mass of darkness, this is the peaceful state. This is a sublime state. The stealing of all formations, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. This is his faculty of wisdom. Meaning to say, the day that the Four Noble Truths become self-evident to you and that you just see it in daily lives, you just see it. The day that happens, the ignorance is fading away. When that ignorance fades away, the mental state of one like this is peaceful. 
so peaceful. There isn't an arising. Stealing of all formations, there isn't the arising of one thing. You let go. Relinquishment of all... There is a letting go of formation. You see, our mind labels things. We label. That in itself is formation. Bottle, this, that, people, etc., etc. The labeling is a form of formation. It goes down to the level of neutrality towards everything. No arising towards everything. And that's a peaceful state. When you begin to understand that, that's Panya. Okay? Note, again and again strive, again and again recollect, again and again concentrate. Strive is virya, recollect, sati, concentrate, samadhi, fact. Okay? Again and again understood with wisdom. Spins, you gain faith. Do you see what's happening here? What is shown here is your practice, you see and understand, your faith deepens. With the deepening of your faith, you are inspired to practice, your mind gains a certain tranquility, a certain neutrality, it is able to establish, if not just establish, it will deepen awareness, the concentration grows, the wisdom grows. This is a journey where the mental states reinforce each other. At the start point of the journey, you have to learn to recognize the mental states, the different mental states, each one as it is. That's the start point. So the mindfulness, the right mindfulness, right at the beginning is intended for you to begin to understand mental states in the mind. The good ones, the, the, when I say good, it means they will help you in the practice to realize Nibbana. The not good ones, the bad ones, are the ones who will obstruct you. So Nivaranas, the hindrances obstruct you. The jhanic factors will help you. So the good ones will help you in understanding. The not good ones will obstruct your seeing. And the mindfulness practice is for you to begin to be able to discern the different types of mental states, to recognize which are the ones that will help, learn to get rid of the ones that will not help, that will obstruct you, and you continue. You recognize, you do it. You recognized it, then you let them be. That's not very smart. I recognize craving, nivarana. But never mind, it's okay. It's okay. Just let them be. After a while, they will be like moss grow on wall, the mental walls that you have. So right mindfulness is learning to recognize the different types of mental states. Right effort is getting rid of them or proliferating them because they are part of building the conditions in the mind, that, uh, creating a mind that can see the Dhamma. And as you do it, you first must recognize, right? Then you must know how to put them in sequence. I have faith. I will try to do my best. When I try to do my best, my mind calms down. It is happy. It can see that it will be sati. Ah, then it can go into meditation. And then it can begin to understand the Dhamma. And then my faith will build. And it goes on. This is a journey. A development. A spiritual development journey of the mind. So your eightfold path, seven factors of enlightenment, your five mental powers, uh, the faculties, the efforts, and so on and so forth. 
Take a picture before I click. <laughs> they are to work together and help you to see the Dhamma. Together. They spin. They really spin. If you begin to walk this journey, you will then begin to realize that mental states can grow and they can diminish. You two days never meditate, you'll find that it starts to diminish the concentration skills. If you meditate every day and you get and you are preparing it, see, meditation must prepare one there. No, I feel like sitting, I sit. Can, uh, but nothing happens. Uh. What does it mean by preparation? You saw what I said earlier on, right? Keeping the mental space clean. Which means to say, if you really are serious about the practice, in your daily life, learn to scold less. Learn to moderate your wants. Learn to let go. Learn to control the ego a little bit. Your ego very the noisy. Tell the ego, go sit in the corner, keep quiet. But I got no time for you. Leh. Do little things like that to keep the mind space a bit quieter. If your mind can go a little bit quieter, not so angry, not so, not so disturbed, not so restless, not so lazy and so on, when the mind can do all those things, when you sit, you will find that it's actually quite happy. It is happy to sit quietly and let you watch the breathing. And then if you watch the, and if you find that when you sit quietly and watch that breathing, and you find that you can actually watch it without too much effort for a while, what will happen? You will start to feel nice. You will. If you have never reached the point where you start to feel nice, breathing is nice. If you have never reached that point, you have never done a day of proper meditation. Okay? I'm telling you. If you have never reached a point where you feel quite happy being with your best friend, the breath, the breathing. If you have never been happy just watching it, Actually, your meditation is not called meditation. It's called something else. La. <laughs> I have no idea why it is, but this is not called meditation. Because meditation done correctly, you will feel it is very nice to sit with the object you choose to focus the mind. It doesn't have to be a case where the mind must stay still. Oh, the mind cannot stay still. Eh. Then you get so agitated, you know. It's not like that. It's that just be patient, be gentle, be quiet, slowly, slowly sit down, and then you just sit with the breathing. It will happen. But all those preliminary steps need to be taken. You don't take those steps, it will not happen. Imagine the whole day you are agitated, you you, you get very disturbed, you have restless energy, you jump after your kids, you jump after your colleagues, you are the very the nyao type that say, cannot like this, cannot like that, why you're like this? If you keep doing that, uh, then now you sit. And then you say, I shall be calm. And may you all be well and uh, what, uh, happy. <laughs> How? The habit's not there. You see what I'm saying? So, and then, the day that you actually sit, and it's really quite good, huh? it's quite good, and suddenly you feel inspired because you are feeling very peaceful, it is very nice sitting, then what? Tomorrow night, you try to reproduce the thing. And you find that it wouldn't work. Why? Because in the second night, your mind is wanting something. When your mind wants to reproduce that what you experienced yesterday, you don't get it. The mix, the cocktail mix is just not right. Because you want it. So then what do you do? What you do is, you will say it's okay. 
I will let it go. I will do exactly as the Buddha said. And then you start again. There is a sutta, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, 119. I think Majimani Kaya 119. If you're very keen on concentration meditation, look up, look out that, look up that, that sutta. Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, 119. If you refer to the sutta and you follow it very closely, you will get it. That's concentration meditation. Thank you. That's concentration meditation. Okay? That's my niece. <laughs> okay. Any question? There is one question from the brother over there. Thank you, Sister Sebabi, for the very penetrating and enlightened uh, Dhamma talk. Okay, my, my question is not directly, so directly related, it's more contemporary. It's about the Zika virus. Okay. <laughs> so here we are, we are having Zika and the Aedes mosquito, and, and also which cause chikukunia and dengue. So, why can't we destroy it? We, we must destroy it, otherwise the people will suffer. So how do you reconcile that with the Dharma? Is it? We have to kill, whether you like it or not, wipe out the mosquito, and yet the Dharma says, thou refrain from killing. You're kidding me, right? This is a, this is a talk on the 37 factors of enlightenment. <laughs> But what, what the thing? seven factor got no Zika virus there. The, the five precepts, the five precepts has uh, refrain from killing. Okay, that's part of your talk. I know. You enjoy putting me in a spot, right? <laughs> Favorite pastime. No, actually, the way I, the way I do it is this. I'm not advocating this as the policy that you all, must, you all must follow. In the Dhamma, in the Dhamma, we are all responsible for our own action. And we are all responsible for our own salvation. That means, that means, the individual makes his choices in what is helpful to the development of his mind. Some may say that, eh, that one not very communal. No, you think about it. If you are truly cleaning up your mind, if you're truly cleaning up your mind, and you're doing it sincerely, not doing it because you want to look good, but doing it sincerely, that you are really going for an understanding of the Dhamma, then what you are doing is really making the mind purer. A purer mind has no one thing, or it will minimize the one thing. The reason why we eat into another's space is because of our one thing. The more you want, the more you eat into another's space. But if you reduce your own ego and you reduce your own wanting, your own craving, you are shrinking the space that you take for another, from another. You understand that? We have conflict. If you look at your mind, the reason why you get annoyed, the reason why you have conflict is because you perceive that you are losing space to another. Another is eating your space. You say, no, uh, uh, not really. I, I, I don't see. Think about it. Say someone comes in and maybe you don't agree with his smell. You don't agree, but doesn't mean he's bad. So I will say, you don't agree with his smell. As far as you are concerned, he is actually, his smell is actually intruding into your fresh air. That's why you upset. If you were there and he's there and you don't smell anything, you're not upset. No space intrusion. 
You get it? Very often we get upset because of that space intrusion. How does that link to mosquitoes? It is your perception of how things are a threat to you, your space. And because of your perception, then you will think about how to protect that space and you whack. If you are a practitioner, if you're a practitioner and you are mindful that the mind keep it clean, then your instinct would be, let it be. Your instinct will be just let it be and let it go. Your instinct. It is you. Let's not talk about the rest of the world. It's just you. Let it be, let it go. But of course, if your instinct is, I cannot kill it. I kill already very bad karma. Leh. I will not kill. Let him kill. Lah. <laughs> this is the same. Lah. Your mind is still protecting yourself. You are still being not so nice. Lah. But then if you say, no choice. I need to protect. Between one, I will choose. Then what are you focusing on? You're focusing on making the sacrifice. Then even though you are the one who committed the act, but there is a dual, dual impact on your mind. There is, I'm trying to protect, I'm trying to help, and there is, I'll do it. Doesn't matter, I'll just do it. What do you have in your mind? It's actually mental strength. There is goodness there. You understand? So it all boils down to what is going on in your mind. And only you know. You can say anything. You can make yourself look good and say anything. But you know for yourself what's in your mind. And then don't bluff yourself. I'm trying to save the world. I'm trying to save the world. Sure, whatever. But actually, it's, I'm very scared. I must save the world. Then you are still staining the mind. So it's not the action. It's what's in there that makes the difference. Okay? I used to say this. Righteous, self-righteous, not the same thing. You must know for yourself what you are. Righteous is about doing the right thing, staying honest to the practice, honoring the teacher, honoring the path. That's being righteous. Being self-righteous is because you're not doing the right thing. How come you like this? How come you like that? It's all about how come another is not doing it right. It is not about why you are, you yourself are not doing it right. Someone who is self-righteous has a problem because he's not looking inwards at his mind, he's looking outwards, looking for the perfect condition. That's not our practice. In our practice, everyone, you got your own mind. Now, if everyone in this room got their mind, if everyone in this room got their own mind, do the right thing by the Dhamma, do it right, there will be no problem here. You don't have to worry about saving another. No one needs your saving. Because everyone will look after and make sure they are not intruding into another's space. They're being considerate. They're being careful and kind. So, if, everyone, if every one of us do the right thing, there is no need for saving and helping you are trying to do. It is when we are not nice, when we intrude, then comes all the having to manage the conflict, moderation and so on and so forth. That is when it all starts. Okay? All right. In, okay. So I have one more question from the brother here. You have two more. There's one more there. I'm not sure 
I, I honestly am not sure whether the Mahayana teaching talks about the 13 seven factors of enlightenment. Does anyone know that? When you, when one has, if you do the 37 factors properly, the ego fades. There will be no ego. But if you, ego is a state of mind that arises because of the sense of an, a, an I. Actually, they are not the same. That you hold the view there is an I, an essence, and the arising of the ego, they're not the same, okay? One is a view, a, a lens, a, con a, a lens through which you see the world. The other one is just a mental, it's an, it's an energy. We call it mana in Pali, okay? When your mind, when you develop sati, assuming you have got, Assuming you have got the, the faith and you have, you're practicing hard, you're trying to do the right thing by the Dhamma, assuming all this is done, huh? then comes a clarity about the arising of a mental state in the mind. What kind of mental energies that arise, you know, you have clarity. Okay? You will then be very clear when the energy of the ego arises. And in accordance with this practice, whatever energy that arises and it's unhelpful to the, to the realization of Nibbana, you will learn to let it go. And ego counts as an energy that is very unhelpful for the realization of Nibbana. So therefore, this ego has to be seen as a mental energy and let it drop. Let it drop. The problem for many of us is we see this mental energy of ego and then we say, this is me. This is I. This has to be protected because I can't feel, I, I don't like dropping it. And so we hold on to it. And the more we hold, the bigger it grows. Whereas if you are able to say, this mental energy is not conducive for the practice, I'm going to drop it. Just, just ignore it. Ignore it. When you start to ignore it, initially it's hard, but after a while, it becomes easier. It will still arise, but it doesn't arise like a big boulder. It arises like a pebble. A pebble is okay. A boulder will crush you. So think, just see it as a mental energy, and it's easier to handle. Okay? Sorry. Okay. Someone? Yeah, so in view of time, I will just take two more questions for Sister Sylvia. I think I have one brother here and one more brother over there. Thanks. Uh, it was a very uh, good talk. Uh, I have been meditating and uh, never thought of uh, all this preparation that you have actually mentioned. I think that is very, very timely. Thank you so much. The, my question here is that just now you mentioned uh, investigating as well as concentration. So is investigating the concentration or concentrating on the investigation? So which is which? When you're talking about the Bujangas, right? Dhamma uh, Vichaya, that one. Huh? That one is an investigation that is that, that one is not samadhi. That's not concentration. That one, there is a focus. The mind become aware of that general awareness because it starts with sati first. There is a general awareness. And in that general awareness, when it becomes steady, when that sati is steady, the mind is clear. And then the mind may, may begin to feel the arising of wanting to see the Dhamma at that point. This is the point when it's clear, it's quiet. And then it may dawn on you at that point that all things are anicca. And then you will smile at it. It's a, it is anicca. You understand? It is anicca. And they are all conditioned. And you will smile at that too. It is conditioned. And the mental states that flip-flop, flip-flops, 
or it may not flip flop. It's just a mental state, but that is a passing of time, and you're aware of it. It's change in your mind. You say this is change, and you know what? In all these, I don't see the soul. I don't see the eye. I am just aware of a process of seeing, the process of noting, a process of being. And it is nice because there is no one thing, no, no arising of one thing. And it is nice. And if I don't hold on to anything, it is just a moment of living. And it is nice. It's good to use simple word. And then that is just like that. So when you register all these, that is dhamma vichaya. Or if you are sitting, and you observe the form, you are sitting in meditation, and you observe the form, and you feel heavy, and you say, "This is earth element." You feel growling and noise and running water in the tummy, and you go, "This is water element." Air element. You feel heat, fire element, and then you say the body is no more than these four elements. That's dhamma vichaya. When you are not thinking, you are noting, observing a phenomenon, and then say it is this. This is this. This is that. Mindfulness and noting, registering, sati, sati. And dhamma bichaya. When that happens, the mind gets very energized. It's very happy. I'm seeing the dhamma. I'm experiencing the dhamma. When you experience the dhamma, that state, the mind is very joyous. That is your pity. In that state of joyous, the mind is quiet, content, at peace. That is pasadi. And it's very concentrated. That's concentration, samadhi. You can do all these. They actually run as a factor together, very fast. There is the detachment. When you first experience it, it may come as a sequence. Once you become familiar with this kind of a mental state, they come as a cluster. At any one time, it's together, and there is a detachment to the sensations. Okay. Okay, and the last question is. Uh, Sister Silver Bay, um, I have this uh, craving, craving for answer, so I slip in two questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you mentioned you use kaya. To refer to the body. In other terms, there's also the word rupa. Is there a distinction between the two? The same. Same. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, sometimes we come across terms like not me, not the mantra, not me, not mine, not myself. Not mine, not myself. Is what is that distinction there? There was some, you know, significance. It's actually not like this. It's actually not, not mine. Meaning. Is a possession. We, our our ego, our ego rests on objects. Our ego must rest on something because it's not real. It's mind made. Therefore, the ego all has to rest on something. The ego rests on possession, not mind. The ego rests on a identity that it creates, not I. And the ego rests on a thought, an idea, a view, not self. Okay, I am this. I am, I am calm. I am calm. Calm becomes I. The ego needs to rest on something. So the ego. Takes on calm and owns calm. I am calm. I am a teacher. The ego takes on an identity. It becomes something. That is I. 
Self is an idea of an entire construct. It is not just one adjective. It is an overall thing that you construct. There is a soul. Soul is self. It is a construct. It's an idea. It's a thought. So one is an object that you own. Another one is descriptions that you ascribe to yourself. Then there are package deal, which is a self. Package deal. But the package deal is a mental construct. All of them are mental constructs, of course. But that one is a package deal. How do you describe? Because you will say, how do you describe yourself? You don't say, how do you describe I? Myself. I, this concept of a self is a package deal that has details. Whereas the I is actually just one, ident one form, one identity, it's different parts of it. One is something you describe with one adjective. I am rich, I am poor, I am happy, I am not. That is an I. The self is who is this being made up of the following things which you construct into an identity as a whole. Okay? It says thought. I'll give you an example. Uh, philosophers, when philosophers talk about the I, the philosopher is talking about a thought. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about the thought of something called a person. What is the person? Who is the person? That one comes as a thought process. A, sorry. A, 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 a thought, an entity that has been created into something real, an entity. So the soul, some people will say atta, which is a soul, an essence. If you die and you get reborn, I mean, and there's a rebirth, right? When a person dies, then the, the energy surges up and starts again. What do you call that? Beings, the rest of us will say, there is an, there's something that goes from point A to B. That's the self. The self has moved on. Because the I is one, one lifetime. But once it's over, it's finished. And then there is an arising. So something moves. Therefore, that's the self. It's a package. It's not just individual characteristics. And all of them are thought construct. It, it becomes more complicated. The easiest, the easiest thought construct is something belonging to me. Animal has that too. Something belonging to the dog. This is my owner. This is the house I stay in. Even the dog has that sense of ownership. Okay? You take it one step further, the next level is the human that says, I'm this. The dog doesn't say, I'm furry. I'm white and pretty. The dog doesn't do that. But the human does it. Oh, I, I, I don't think the dog does it. Lah. I don't think the dog goes into a look at the mirror and says, I'm prettier than you. I don't think so. Lah. But the human does it. So the human sense of the ego is bigger. And then the really, really too clever human will say, you know, all these change. All these change, right? Your face will change, wrinkles will grow. All these change. But the eye, that sense of the depth of me, that doesn't change, you say. That doesn't change. And that's where the problem begins because you don't see change. You, you believe there is no change. You see essence. That essence is the self, the utter. That which doesn't change is the other. But it's a thought construct. Because essentially in our practice, you are to stare at everything. The form which you can see, the moment-to-moment -moment emotions which you can see, the moment-to-moment -moment mental composition you can see, and beyond that moment-to-moment -moment composition 
is your impression of a collective whole, which you happily call self. That is absolutely construction. That's self. Okay? Okay. Thank you.